So we've suffered through some chemistry fundamentals at this point, and now we are ready to apply those fundamentals to a very important environmental science concept, which is the importance of water, H2O. Um, water is obviously an extremely important molecule for life on Earth. It is the basis for all living organisms, from plants to animals to bacteria and beyond. It's found inside of our cells. It's found outside of our cells. The weight of the average human body is about 60 to 70 percent water. And it's, of course, found all over the surface of the planet. The majority of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Um, obviously, water plays a very prevalent role in life and the environment. But why is it so important? So water actually has many special qualities that are brought about by the fact that it is a covalently bonded polar molecule. So let's remind ourselves of what that means. Water, or H2O, is made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and the hydrogen atoms each share not transfer their electron with the oxygen atom. So that makes these bonds covalent, not ionic. And on top of that, the oxygen atom is, remember, a notoriously greedy element. The oxygen atom is more greedy for electrons than the hydrogen atom. So it draws those electrons toward itself. And you end up with a polar molecule. The hydrogen ends are each slightly positive with fewer electrons. The oxygen is slightly negative because it has relatively more electrons. The polar nature of the water molecule and the fact that it has these negative and positive poles gives water many of the qualities that allow it to support life. And that's because when you're looking at a body of water, or the water that's inside of your cells, or inside of an organism in general, you're not just talking about one single water molecule, but many, many water molecules together. So when you have a collection of water molecules like this, the positive ends of one molecule are attracted to the negative ends of other molecules. So these yellow dotted lines here represent this network of attractions between separate water molecules. And you can imagine how the water molecules want to stick to each other and remain as a semi-cohesive unit. And that all arises from the fact that they are polar molecules. Because if they were nonpolar molecules, then those attractions would not exist because the molecules wouldn't have those dramatic positive and negative ends that allow them to be attracted to each other. This network of attractions between water molecules gives water those special properties that make it uniquely able to support life. One of these properties is that water molecules exhibit features called cohesion and adhesion. So cohesion describes the fact that water molecules stick to each other, and adhesion is the fact that water molecules will stick to other non-water molecules too, so long as those other non-water molecules are also polar. So cohesion is something you've probably observed before. If you've ever done that little experiment where you drop water on the surface of a penny and watch as this big dome of water forms, and you're expecting it to burst and flow off the penny, but it just keeps getting taller. The reason why water is able to support this dome shape without collapsing off of the surface of the penny is because of cohesion. The water molecules stick to each other. If you do this with another liquid, like ethanol, for example, you cannot achieve this dome shape because the cohesion just isn't there between the molecules. In nature, these cohesive and adhesive forces allow water to be transported. So for example, water is pulled through plant roots and distributed throughout the plant because of its ability to be cohesive with itself and adhesive to other molecules inside of the plant. In this demonstration here, what we see is a paper towel being bent and dipped into a cup of colored water on the right and then an empty cup on the left. And the water gets drawn up into the material of the paper towel and then the force of gravity pulls it into the empty cup. 
And the reason why water is pulled into the paper towel is because of adhesion of the water molecules to the paper towel. And the cohesion then pulls the other water molecules along behind it. And this is exactly how water moves through plants as well as through other living organisms. And without cohesion and adhesion, this transport of water would not occur. Another important property that arises from the polar nature of the water molecule is water's ability to maintain a stable temperature. Water has this remarkable ability to keep a stable temperature even when it's absorbing a lot of heat. And a thought experiment that I like to pose as a demonstration of this point is to ask you to imagine that it's a hot summer day in Southern Arizona, 115 degrees outside, you've got your car parked out front and you've got a swimming pool in the backyard. Which would you rather do? Go lay on the hood of your car in a swimsuit or jump into your swimming pool in a swimsuit? Obviously, we all choose the pool because the metal hood of the car is blazing hot, but the water in the pool will be a nice, pleasant temperature. And that's not because one is getting more heat than the other. The weather conditions aren't any different between your front yard and your backyard. It's because of the substance that they're each made out of and that substance's ability to stabilize temperature. So the temperature of a substance on a physical level is related to the motion of its molecules. The faster and more erratically those molecules are moving, the higher the temperature of the substance is. And when it comes to water, those attractions that we pointed out between individual water molecules keeps the motion of the molecules calm and steady. They can't move erratically as easily because they're stuck together in this network of attractions. So the temperature remains stable, unlike the temperature of the metal hood of the car. And that brings us to the third and final property of water that derives from its polar nature. Um, and that is that ionic molecules and polar molecules are able to easily dissolve in water. It's a good solvent. And that's because if we can return to this picture, those attractions between water molecules can be substituted for attractions to other non-water molecules that have full or partial electric charges. For example, if we drop a molecule of salt, sodium chloride, NaCl, into a sample of water, it fits right in because the sodium ion has a positive charge and is attracted to the negatively charged ends of the water molecules. And then the chloride atom has a negative charge and it's attracted to the positively charged ends of the water molecules. So it fits right into this network of attractions. Now, sodium chloride is an ionic molecule, but as I said, covalent molecules can dissolve in water too, as long as they are also polar like water is. So water is a great solvent. It can dissolve polar molecules and ionic molecules. And this is essential for living organisms because as you know, living things are made primarily of water. And many of the important biological molecules that support our functions, like for example, salts and sugars, need to be able to dissolve in water so that they can be transported throughout an organism, be involved in chemical reactions, etc. And what you see in this animation is a spoonful of salt being dropped into a sample of water. And you can see as it quickly dissolves into that network of attractions with the water molecules. If substances were not able to dissolve in water like this, then to function as a living organism would be impossible. Okay, for the final section of this page, we're going to switch to tackle a different, but nonetheless very important chemistry topic, and that is acids and bases. You may already know that acids and bases are substances on the opposite ends of what is called the pH scale. But what does the pH scale actually tell us? Well, the pH scale measures the concentration of hydrogen ions in a particular substance. That's what the H stands for in pH is hydrogen ions. Whether something is an acid or a base, and also how acidic or how basic it is on the scale, is dictated by the concentration of hydrogen ions that is found in that substance. But when we say hydrogen ions, what are we actually talking about? Well, remember that an ion is an atom that has an electric charge 
resulting from having gained or lost an electron. So in the case of the element hydrogen, hydrogen is actually the smallest and simplest element in existence. You can see from its square here that's been extracted from the periodic table, the number at the top indicates that it has one single proton in its nucleus uh, and one electron in its orbital. So an atom of hydrogen um, becomes an ion when it loses that electron and gives it away to another atom. And when this happens, all that is left behind is the proton in the nucleus. So this free floating proton is the hydrogen ion and the concentration of these things is what the pH scale measures in any given substance. So now we know that the pH scale measures um, hydrogen ions. Getting back to the scale itself, the scale runs from zero to 14. Right in the very middle of the scale is the number seven, which is the value assigned to pure water. And pure water is considered neutral. It's neither acidic nor basic. As you go lower and lower on the scale of pH values, the concentration of hydrogen ions actually increases. Things get more acidic as you go lower on the pH scale because hydrogen ions go up. Conversely, as you go higher and higher on the scale above seven, the concentration of hydrogen ions decreases and the substance becomes more basic. So anything below seven is an acid and the lower the number, the more hydrogen ions the stronger the acid. We can see that something like battery acid is a very strong acid, has a pH of around zero. If we go just a little higher, we have stomach acid at one, lemons, soda, tomatoes, coffee, milk is just slightly acidic. Anything above seven is basic. And if you get higher and higher in pH values, there are fewer and fewer hydrogen ions and that base becomes stronger. So some mildly basic substances that are seen in nature are human blood, egg whites. Farther up the scale, we're getting really strong things like bleach or drain cleaner. Um, and pH is an important component of living organisms' homeostasis or their ability to maintain stable internal conditions like we talked about in chapter one. So if the environmental pH is too far out of the range of where an organism can function, then it can threaten the organism's life. And later on in the course, we will talk about how changes in environmental pH are threatening ecosystems.